last week. It's called Keeping Hope Alive, uh, One Woman, 90,000 Lives Changed. So we just want to talk for a little bit uh, about the book, and the way we're going to do it is uh, just have a little bit of a, a conversation. So Dr. Abdi and I work together on the book. It's her memoir, but I helped her write it. Um, and so we, we were in conversation for about two, two and a half years. 
uh, in order to write it. So we want to just give you a little bit of a sense of what the story is about. And I'll do kind of a brief introduction first so you have a sense of who, uh, who she is and why she wrote this book. Um, so Dr. Hawa Abdi is a Somali human rights activist. Uh, she's a lawyer and also a doctor specializing in gynecology. Uh, she founded the Dr. Hawa Abdi Foundation, which runs a hospital and school in one of the largest internally displaced persons camps in the country, offering sanctuary to nearly 90,000 people. Glamour Magazine named her Woman of the Year in 2010, uh, dubbing her equal parts Mother Teresa and Rambo. <laughs> uh, one of her daughters, Deco, is also here with us today. Deco was born in Mogadishu, grew up feeding the refugees that her mother was harboring, uh, and earned a, uh, her own medical degree in Moscow in, in 2000. Uh, she was an OBGYN resident in Russia up until 2003, and continued to go back to the camp to work during her holidays. Came to America as a refugee in 2003, and naturalized American in 2008. Uh, so Keeping Hope Alive is the story of Dr. Hawa Abdi's incredible life. Um, we'll give you just kind of a little bit of a taste of what she's seen. Uh, Somalia is in East Africa, as many of you know, uh, most of you know. Um, and it became independent in 1960 when Dr. Abdi was 13 years old. So in some ways, her story um, is also the story of Somalia. So she came of age, kind of as the country came of age, and has seen over the years of the Somalia civil war, um, everything from the most beautiful days in the country to uh, the most horrible. But so I wanted to ask a question, ask you to talk about how you became a doctor. Um, in the 1960s, it was rare for Somali girls to get an education at all, let alone to get a medical degree. Uh, and you received a scholarship in the Soviet Union. So I wanted to ask you to tell everyone why you decided to become a doctor and what it was like to study abroad and to come back to become the country's first female gynecologist. Thank you. Good evening, friends. Thank you for coming. My name is Dr. Hawa Abdi. That I already tell you. Because I became a obstetrian gynecology. My mother, when I was a child, she became sick, her 70 pregnant. And they had a diet for delivery complication. That time, in Somalia, there was no doctors enough. There was some Italian doctors who just treating the patients, but not enough even medicine at that time. That time, I decided to be an OBGY specialist. When my mother died, I feel deep pain. pain so. I tried to, to avoid other children, the pain I felt to help mothers in labor. That's how I decided that time to become a OBGY specialist. So you went and got your medical degree in the Soviet Union, you came back, started a practice in Somalia in the 70s, and then in 1983, uh, Dr. Abdi established a one-room clinic on her family farm about 20 miles outside of the capital city of Mogadishu to help women in the area who didn't have the transportation to get to the city to deliver their babies, to help them deliver kind of closer to their villages where they lived. So for years, you had a really lovely life. You had a practice, you, had, you were raising your children, you had a beautiful farm. And then in 1991, the government in Somalia collapsed. Uh, Deco, you were uh, 15 at the time when the government collapsed in 1991. So I wanted to ask you briefly to tell everyone what changed in your personal life and also in Somalia uh, after that. <laughs> Thank you guys for all coming and, and trying to share to bring out this amazing work and life of my mother with the help of Sarah uh, for her wonderful writing. Uh, and of course, I was, I was a teenager when Somalia collapsed, and I was as any other teenager. You cannot imagine one day you don't have school, you don't have your friends, there's a gunshot is going, you have to stay home, you cannot do anything. 
and the only thing you could see is people dying in front of you and you have to be in front of the line in the hospital. So my mom that morning when the war broke out told me you cannot go to a school. And I was telling no, I have my final, I'm going to go. <laughs> She's like, no, you're not going anywhere. The simple daughter, mother, I, you know, argument being a teenager, I say, okay, I'm not going to go, but I sneaked. <laughs> <laughs> I took the mini buses in Somali, we have mini buses working, and I went to school, and the school was empty. As my mom told me, you should not go, and then I realized when I was in school, and I'm in the front line, in the middle of the world, I was like, my mom was right, but I didn't listen to her. So our dean was there, and he, he tried to <laughs> tell us, don't go anywhere until your parents came. And it was one of the uh, horrifying experiences of my life, uh, because we didn't know what to do. And we had right shelling going on with a bunch of kids, and we went in one room to the classroom to another room. And uh, we were telling later on when we left you know, that area, coming to my place, like, in the movie it's much better to watch you know war and then instead of being in reality in front of lines. But I, I think we survived and I, 2000, in 1991 it was terrible not only for me, it was hundreds and thousands of young generation of Somali teenagers. It was very hard and difficult time in Somali, all of us. So the story of this book is the story of how this one room clinic became uh, this massive camp for displaced people. And the way that that happened is because uh, Dr. Abdi and her daughters welcomed her patients to, you know, to basically the clinic, gave them free health care, and when they needed to flee the war, uh, they, she, she let them stay on the land, they gave free health care, but also free water, free land. So the word got out, and more and more people came over the years and Somalia has been unstable for now almost, what well, was unstable for 22 uh, years. So what started with a few families coming and sort of staying for what they hoped were a few days ended up being 90,000 plus people living there for more than 20 years. So it became really a, a, a big city um, of which you were the mayor. So <laughs> the story of the book is the story of how this happened and how one family navigates this. Um, and it, it also is the story of kind of all of the conflict in Somalia. And the last story that we wanted to tell you from the book is kind of one of the most dramatic things out of the many that have happened over these many years. Um, the fact that Dr. Abdi was, in fact, the mayor of a, a pretty big city was something that a lot of uh, people who had control over the area in Somalia were not so happy about. She was a woman running things in an area where there was a very fundamentalist regime who had control. So in May of 2010, the, the militia that had control of the area came uh, to Dr. Abdi and, and asked her, didn't ask her, excuse me, told her uh, to hand over the camp to them. So I was hoping that you could tell that story briefly and, and, and tell everyone, maybe Deco, you can help, kind of what, what you said to these young men who asked you to hand over your camp and, and the clinic, which had become a 400-bed hospital. Um, you know, what did you tell them and what happened next? Those young people, when they come to me, they say, this city is growing up, you are, women and all aged women. So we are young and men. You have to hand over this administration to us. I say, I cannot. You are young and men. But what you have done, your society. I am not going to hand over my property, my private property, I say. After two weeks, they attacked with Many militias, heavy gun, heavy Michigans, and the uh, uh, technical cars. They kill some of my guards, and their people died. One, 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 one militia man. During that attack, my daughters were outside. So they called me. So they called me. I said, they, we were attacked. 
and they immediately connect me BBC Somali service. Thanks God that time he was in the, in the radio office. He immediately broadcast the Somali language and it became as a breaking news for Somali people. They knew what is going on in my camp. They were sending heavy shelling in the hospital where there were as admitted women in labor, children in malnutrition, children with uh, diarrhea. So they hear protesting Somali language, BBC. And they come to me to enter in our room, me and my nurses. They tell me, you talk with, with the media? They took all our phone, phone, mobile, and they bring a car. They say, get up and go in this, in this car. We went, they brought us, they got one room. We were, me and my nurses, then immediately, news spread all Somali community. Uh, then people, IDBs, they were hearing, they ran from the camp, some of them. They re some remaining in the place because they were sell sell sending it to us, heavy shelling. They have done demonstration. And diaspora, Somali diaspora, they call the heads of this Hezbo Islam people, extremists. They call and they say, what are you doing? You are fighting with the women in labor and the children. There is no militia man but you attack it. So at four o'clock, they kidnapped us, nine. At four o'clock, they give me a phone. And they tell me, call your people, you have many supporters that we did not kill you and we did not harm you. Tell your people that. I called them my uh, daughters. They go. I think it was the most horrifying year for all of us, for, for the camp, for the village. We had this uh, wonderful city growing from being one family, going to 15,000 family, from 400 people to 90,000 people. We're trying to set up a structure. We had a storage room where we it's acting as a, a prison. We had a rules and regulations. We had a president at that time. So suddenly, the hospital get attacked and the camp and everything is destroyed for, for in a, less than 10 hours. 750 guys attacking and just shelling and everybody's running as much as they can and people, kids who are sick who are getting malnutrition feeding. After all that she got kidnapped as she, my mom just shared with you and they released finally. When they hear the media, you know, she has a lot of supporters, everybody was demanding the release. When they released and she came home and they put her home first, I think it's week. They didn't allow you to go anywhere or to talk to me to phone for seven days. And they demanded again to restart the work of the hospital. And everything should be normal. They say, Dr. Howie, you have to act like nothing happened. Go back to your work, uh, go back, open your school, and people have to receive the water. And suddenly she says, no, I'm not going to do that unless you apologize to me. <laughs> Unless you write an apology letter to me, to the community, and to the doctors who transporters who were returning the camp, the hospital. Not only one, she demanded three apology letters. So, <laughs> it, finally it happened, and she, again she made a history, I think, uh, being not only first female gynecologist, not only woman who in Somalia studied her civil society, building the village. And also, it's the first time in history, like, you tell a militia man who kidnapped you, was about to kill you, you, you have to apologize to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and apparently they did. <laughs> they did apologize to her, they wrote the letter, and we started working back, and 
Since then, we're doing good, I think so. No more apology letters. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to just wrap up. Uh, you know, this, this the camp goes on, and, and both Dr. Hala Abdi and, and Deco live in the camp and work and kind of manage this foundation. Um, and it's you know, so this this book is sort of in, is it, is in support of their work, and it's a story of this one family that has really stood as a uh, point of inspiration for Somali people both in the country and really around the world. And it's been amazing for us to come to cities like Columbus and meet uh, so many people who have heard of uh, Dr. Abdi's story and now uh, you're able to meet in person. So I think that we'll, we'll wrap it up um, if, that's, if that works. Uh, and, and offer people an opportunity to... Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, and we, we have a couple of minutes. Otherwise, we'll turn it over and do a signing so you can kind of come up and, and meet her yourself. So. Believe me, you have all the answers in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about the, the clans. To me, that was amazing, all the different clans how they interact with each other. Okay. So the question is about clans in Somalia and, and divisions and kind of how that contributed to, um, to some of the strife going on there. So if you could describe that quickly. Uh, my country was destroyed. People were suffering 22 years because of the clan division. I don't know how it began, but we were a huge government, we were having everything, law and order, but suddenly the society divides, separate by groups of clans, and they began to fight. It was very difficult. I tried to call all the elders people to say, please stop this fighting, because it will it will bring to us a bad place. But it was impossible to stop. So many people, about, I don't know how many billions, they fled from their country. They fled from their property. They fled from their relatives if they could not go together. Many people were suffering at that time. It was in need doctors. Women were running pregnant and delivering on the road, in the middle of the road. Children were dying because of diarrhea, because of malnutrition, because of malaria. So it was terrible. But after people began to come to me, when they are fighting by tribes, I said, please, in my camp, there is no division for money by tribe. If you divide, if you identify it, you are a tribe, you will go out. Here, yeah, somewhere to, to live, water free, healthcare free, education free, but that condition is very important. And at that time, it became men uh, the, uh, domestic violence, men began to beat their wives. And also who beat his wife, we, I prepared two, two rooms. I call <laughs> that place jail. <laughs> <laughs> if you beat your wife, you will go to the jail. But my jail was only 12 hours or 48 hours. 24 or 48 hours. Then after those a committee, elder committee, they were deciding the case. They were going, uh, calling the wife, and uh, after they were going uh, decision, they were doing decision, and it was after their final decision they were informing what they would do. I, said, I was agree because my child not a big child for years or months.